Last week we looked at causation and the but for test that established a causal link between the duty of care owed by the defendant and the damage suffered by the claimant. This week we're going to be looking at legal causation or remoteness and the different things that can break the causal link. These can be known as novus actus interveniens, which is the Latin for new intervening act. And they can act to reduce the liability of the defendant, either partially or completely. Right, let's get started then. So in terms of remoteness, what we're really looking for is someone or something that is acting to break the chain of causation. And there are a few examples that we can give right off the bat. So the actions of a third party might act to break the chain of causation, someone who is neither the claimant or the defendant in a particular case. An external event such as an act of God can also act to break the chain of causation. So in Karslogi Steamship Company, there was a storm. And finally, the claimant themselves might act to break the chain of causation. So as per Section 1 of the Law Reform Contributory Negligence Act 1945, if a claimant was, for example, 30% responsible for the damage that they have suffered, the defendant might have to pay 30% less damage overall. What formulation or test can we actually use then to define what an intervening act actually is? Well, Lord Reed tried to come up with a test first of all in Dorset Yacht Company, and he said that an intervening act is anything that is less than very likely to happen. But the problem with this is that it makes it very difficult to break the chain of causation. This was a criticism espoused by Lord Denning in the case of Lamb that we'll look at in a minute, and he gives the example of a prisoner escaping from jail. And he said that if a prisoner escaped from jail, it's very likely that they would steal a car so that they can get away. It's also very likely that they would steal a set of clothes and very likely that they would then steal another car so that they could evade the police. All of these things are very likely, but you can see that it's extending that chain of causation very far and it's difficult to define something as an intervening act because it could be considered very likely to happen. This was then an unsatisfactory test, and so in the case of Lamb and Camden London Borough Council, Lord Justice Oliver tried to come up with a different formulation. He said that an intervening act is what the reasonable man would actually foresee if he thought about it. And the aim with this was to make it a little bit easier for an intervening act to break the chain of causation. So what tests can we actually use then? Well, Lord Denning in this case actually goes on to say that he doesn't think that we should necessarily be too reliant on any particular test. We could certainly look to Lord Reed or Lord Justice Oliver as a starting point, but we have to be aware of the various policy factors that come into play when defining an intervening act. So if we look at the facts of Lamb and Camden London Borough Council, here the council was negligent in terms of the waterworks outside of a property and it made the property in uninhabitable for more than a year and had to be vacated. During that time there were a number of squatters who came and lived in the house and you might think well that's possibly a very likely scenario given that it had to be vacated by the person who was actually living there at the time, and Camden had a notorious problem during the 1980s of squatters living in these houses. Yet the courts themselves said that this was actually the responsibility of the tenant lamb. And this might seem a little bit surprising at first, that there would be an intervening act that is breaking the chain of causation. But we have to consider that it's actually the responsibility of the tenant to make sure that squatters don't get into the property. And furthermore, the key policy factor here is that Lamb should have taken out home insurance to make sure that she is properly compensated through that scheme, rather than simply charging the council. And so there's a number of factors that came into play in this case that don't really fit into the tests put forward either by Lord Reed or Lord Justice Oliver in this particular case. 
So to give another example of a policy area that's important, we can look at rescuers. And we can say that the actions of rescuers will rarely be seen as breaking the chain of causation. In the Oropisa from 1943, the captain of a ship went over by lifeboat to go to another ship that had crashed into his. And unfortunately, the lifeboat sank and he and some of his crew died. Now, the argument in the case was that this was not what the captain should have done and that this was an intervening act that broke the chain of causation. But the court said that this was a perfectly sensible thing to do for a captain because he was just trying to save the rest of his uh, crew and make sure that they survived. And so his actions as a rescuer are less likely to break the chain of causation. However, if we look at the case of Knightley and Johns here, the um, defendant in the case had negligently overturned his car in a tunnel and the police wanted to shut off the tunnel while they dealt with the accident. However, the policeman was particularly stupid in this case and he drove down the wrong side of the street to try and close down the tunnel. And the motorist crashed into the uh, policeman and he unfortunately suffered serious injuries. But there's no way that it could be said that this was the fault of the defendant whose car originally had overturned in the tunnel. Really, this was re the responsibility of the policeman who should have uh, tried to close off the tunnel in a safe and sufficient manner. Next, let's have a look at acts of the claimant. Uh, this can be a partial defence, as I mentioned earlier. It could also be a complete defence. So if the defendant has acted particularly stupidly, and is completely responsible for the damage that he or she has suffered, then the reduction in terms of the damages could be 100% in theory. However, the claimant does have to have acted negligently, and the standard is the usual one of tort of the reasonable person, and there also has to be factual and legal causation, even for the claimant's own actions against him or herself. So basically, it's like proving another tort case, but only in respect of the claimant's actions causing his or her own damage. Obviously, there isn't the same duty of care there, but all of the other elements of tort law that we've talked about previously still apply. In terms of the extent of the damage, the defendant is only liable for the kind of damage that could have reasonably be, been foreseen. And this comes from the famous case of the Wagon Mound Number no. 1 from 1961. And it can be seen that this limits tort law to a great extent, because if there's a certain kind of damage that cannot be foreseen in a particular set of circumstances, then a defendant will not be liable. However, the effect of the decision or the ratio in the Wagon Mound has been severely reduced over the years because of a number of different factors. And the most important factor is that the phrase kind of damage has been very widely interpreted. So it can be interpreted as any kind of physical harm. So in uh, we can look at the eggshell school rule, which talks about taking the victim as you find them, uh, to put that another way. And this links to the famous case of Smith and Leech Brain, which I believe is a case about a um, claimant being burned by a piece of metal. This unfortunately setting off an unusual reaction in their body that caused them to get cancer. And even though the burn and the cancer were completely different kinds of damage, because they could be considered physical harm in the very broad sense, um, the um, claimant was still able to uh, claim the full extent of the damages and there wasn't an intervening act that broke the chain of causation. For property, it's slightly different and there is still more of a strict application. Simply put, this is because the courts are very keen to protect people's physical well-being, but are less likely or less sympathetic towards property damage. Um, so we can look at the case of the Lies Bosch 1933, which appears to be an exception to the eggshell school rule for property. Um, in this particular case, there was a boat that got severely damaged, um, but the company that was involved and that owned the boat um, was not in a position where they had any cash free at that particular time. Their cash was all tied up. 
and so they couldn't um, repair the boat they had to hire a completely different boat and this ended up being more expensive they tried to claim for the full amount and were unsuccessful so the idea of taking the victim i.e the owner of the lies bosch um, as they found them didn't really apply in this particular property case however this decision has been severely undermined by uh, more modern cases such as alcoa minerals and lagden and o'connor in fact lagden and o'connor is almost an identical set of circumstances but for the 21st century um, in this case there was a car accident between the two cars and lagden could not afford to um, have his car repaired instead he had to um, engage in a higher purchase agreement so that he didn't have to pay anything um, he was unemployed at the time and that's why he didn't have any money um, so he managed to get his new car and then he obviously sued for the full amount even though it would have been uh, cheaper in the long run to get the repairs made to the car now whereas in the lies Bosch, the uh, claimant was not able to claim for that full extent the opposite conclusion was reached in Lagden and O'Connor and it was said that um, the, you have to take the victim as you find them as per the eggshell school rule and so it, they were able to claim the full extent of the damages including uh, taking out the higher purchase vehicle rather than the full repair nevertheless the lies Bosch has not been formally overruled and there are still circumstances in which it could apply so in both the lies Bosch and in Lagden and O'Connor and indeed in Alcoa Minerals as well the claimant has always tried to mitigate their losses in other words they haven't gone out and um, bought a Ferrari instead of replacing their car with a completely suitable alternative they've been very sensible in the way that they've approached the case and they've not undertaken any unnecessary expenses if the claimant had failed to do this and had been reckless in terms of their spending thinking that they would just be able to claim it back from the defendant anyway it's very likely that the courts would still apply the lies Bosch and apply the principle that it's the duty of the claimant to not really overspend in terms of mitigating the loss that they have suffered. Finally, in terms of pure economic loss, the principle that I've set out there is a bit of a mouthful, but it's useful information to have at your fingertips. So where a person has a duty of care to provide information, and that information forms the basis for another person's action, they are, when negligent, only liable for foreseeable consequences of the information being wrong. So to put this in a little bit of context, we can look at the SAMCO case from 1999. SAMCO standing for South Australia Asset Management Corporation. And in this case, a company gave information to the bank about the valuation of a particular piece of property. However, because of the company's negligence, they significantly undervalued the piece of property and the bank ended up losing a lot of money. The bank sued the company and the courts rightly said that because of the negligent information that had been provided, it was up to the company to recompense the bank. However, the problems arose when the bank also tried to claim for the money that they had lost on the property because of a downturn in the market. Now, the courts at this stage said, OK, well, it's fine that you can, you can claim for the negligent information that has been provided to you, but there's no way that you should be able to claim for the downturn in the property market because that's completely unpredictable and also unrelated to the information that you originally requested from the company. And there we have remoteness. If this comes up as an essay question in tort law, then there's a number of interesting policy areas to look at. The wagon mound cases are particularly interesting, as is the Lamb and Camden London Borough Council that we also talked about. As part of a problem question, I think that you're going to have to be on the lookout all of the time for things that are potentially intervening acts. Remember, this doesn't necessarily have to be a third party or an act of God. It can also be the acts of the claimant themselves. Once you've identified this, you can also then begin to apply the other principles that we've talked about throughout this lecture and try and apply them as appropriate.
If you enjoyed this lecture, make sure to leave it a like, subscribe for more videos in the future, and also leave any questions that you might have in the comment section below, and I'll make sure to get back to you. Thanks again for watching. Bye!